Hello, it's me, your friendly neighborhood source of occasionally high-quality content, JoeCat. And today I'm going to be answering some of your questions to hold you over for a little while, because simply put, I'm taking some time off. Specifically, all of November. Uh, what this means is that throughout the month there will be no video uploads, but I'm sure you can find plenty of other fun people to watch in the meantime. I'll still be streaming occasionally, I just don't know that I will be constantly announcing it so that I don't flood your feed by posting it in the community tab. I think I might post like a schedule or something. But yeah, there will be a few more videos this month and even at the beginning of November, but uh, don't anticipate many after the first week. I have a few reasons for doing this. It'll give me time to stock up on some videos. I won't really feel the pressure, the need to upload every week, which does sometimes weigh on my creativity. And uh, it'll give me a chance to do a lot of things that I've been putting off due to the mindset of, oh, I, I should, shouldn't do that, I should be working on videos right now. But without the pressure of needing to upload, I can finally do some stuff like watch some shows or movies I've been meaning to, finish the buttload of games in my backlog, some of which I may even play on stream. Hey, twitch.tv slash jokecat. And a few other things, including two very special announcements. So firstly, I confirm I am still making Crap Guide to D&D. Three more episodes. Uh, races, Character Sheet, and Dungeon Master. And you can stop asking now, now that I've confirmed it in a video instead of saying on stream or in the comment section, they're coming. They'll be coming in December just in time for D&D December, and I know a lot of you are happy that that's happening. But I will also say, regarding crap guides that I've never promised or mentioned, or don't say I'm making X, you can safely assume I'm probably not going to make it. I'm sorry to disappoint a lot of you who may be sad at that because I know a lot of you sometimes ask, hey, can you make a crap guy into this thing or this thing? Especially whenever I play a certain game, it's like, uh, like I played SCP and people are like, oh, a crap guy to SCP. I played a little bit of Destiny. Oh, can you make a crap guy to Destiny? And as much as I'd love to do a whole lot of them, I'm just one guy. I can only do so much and I don't really have plans for hiring any help because I'd rather these be personal passion projects than obligations. And also, you know, I like to write my own stuff. Maybe that'll change in the future, but for now, this is how I feel. You know, I, I can't, I don't promise any additional crap guides, just those three. And also, you know, I think I have way more to offer than only the crap guide series. So politely, uh, unless I confirm it, just assume that it's not gonna happen. Sorry. The second announcement. I will be hosting a panel at PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia this December alongside Puffin Forest and Dingle Doodles. It's super duper exciting. It's gonna be my first time hosting a panel and yeah, uh, PAX Unplugged. It goes from December 6th till December 8th. And if anyone else is going or is in the area, I'd love to meet up and take some pictures and hang out. I had the chance to meet some of you, some of the fans at some of the other cons I went this year, and it was super duper fun, so I look forward to this one even more. Now, with those out of the way, let's get to the questions. Also, the footage in the background uh, is just gonna be me playing some Dark Souls 3, because I felt in the mood to play, and I'm trying to get my, my core sort of build back together. It's Dex Faith, my favorite build. So, firstly, some frequently asked questions. Joe, what is your favorite class and or race to play in D&D? My favorite classes are a tie, between Bard and Warlock. I really, really like Bard. I like the idea of being expressive and being a semi-support, semi-utility caster slash skill monkey. I like that Bards get a little bit of everything. And they're just the all-round, like, essence of, of you know, creativity. Uh, they fight through being creative and they tell stories and, you know, d and all about stories, right? I think they're the quintessential d and class. But after researching the Warlock as well, it quickly became one of my favorite classes as well, mostly because of Hexblade. But I just really like that you can customize with all these Eldritch invocations and, like, really, really make your Warlock unique. And it's like, oh, I want my Eldritch Blast to do this thing and then... Or like this, oh, I can suddenly go invisible. You know, I, I said those in the crap guides. It, it seems very fun. As far as race goes, definitely tiefling. Tiefling, I think, is very versatile. Um, first of all, it's the most attractive race. <laughs> I mean, those horns, am I right? But it's also, it's just the most customizable, I feel. Because, like, you can have your tail look all different. You can have various different types of horns. You can have hooves or no hooves. You can have just basically any color of skin. 
maybe in the lore it's very specific, but people just don't care. They just make like blue tieflings and green tieflings. I just think it's really cool. And the horns can be really different. You have bull horns, or dragon horns, or devil horns, or goat horns. I, I think it's really cool. What is the dragon thing that you wear in the Crap Guide series? So a lot of people don't uh, know that I originally started the Crap Guide series with Monster Hunter. And in Monster Hunter, there's a helmet called the Wiggler helmet. And that is the helmet that I wore in that series because I thought it looked funny. And I guess that character just sort of extended to the crap guides. So, and that also means that no, not every person who's wearing a Wiggler helmet is doing a Joe Cat cosplay. They probably just play Monster Hunter or like Monster Hunter. So if you see somebody wearing a Wiggler head, don't assume that it's just like somebody who watches my videos because I'm really worried that I'm copyright infringing on Capcom if people start associating that helmet more with me than with Monster Hunter because uh, that could spell a problem for Monster Hunter and Capcom could possibly get mad at me. So um, yeah. Uh, if you ever see anybody with, uh, mistaking that, uh, kindly just politely correct them and say it's actually from Monster Hunter. So what do I use to draw, animate, and make videos? I use a tablet called a Wacom or Wacom. Uh, I use an Intuos, which is very basic. I think it's the cheapest one. I really, really should transition to using a screen, but I'm just so used to using the Intuos. I animate by drawing in Paint Tool Psy and then exporting each individual frame as a PNG and then putting it in Premiere, which is also the program that I use to make videos. Yeah, it's not ideal. <laughs> I would not recommend anyone wanting to get into animation doing it my way because my way is very, very convoluted and tedious and slow. If you would like to seriously get into animation, I would suggest something like Adobe Animate, or if you don't have the cash, uh, there's Clip Studio Paint, which I heard is really good, and I have it, and I should definitely learn it. But there's plenty of animating programs out there built around animation that you should definitely use and not do it the way I do it. So let's go on to the questions on Twitter first. What aspect of making a video do you enjoy the most? I think getting to make new things, getting to do new stuff, or like imitating the style of something. That's why I like the overly edited series, because I get to imitate the style of like a game or something. And as a graphic designer, that's really fascinating to me, is figuring out and reverse engineering all these graphics and fonts for these games and logos and animation to try and get the same feel as that thing. Like right now, I'm currently working on overly edited SCP from the stream that I did. And like, I made a little loading screen with my logo spinning around and the SCP logo spinning around and it looks really good and it's super satisfying. I love doing that stuff. And, uh, of course, you know, finishing it and uploading it and having it a, being a complete thing is super satisfying. I like that. Who is your favorite Caitlyn? This, <laughs> this is a cheeky question from Caitlyn, who is uh, a member of my friend group. And we have another secondary channel on YouTube called Hijack. And she does art. You should follow her. She does amazing art. Do I have a certain memory that is the basis for what pushes my creative work forward? Uh, I don't really know what exactly you're asking with that question, but I kind- I think I understand. I guess I just like to look at the things that I like and be like, oh, I want to make stuff like that, and then I do it. <laughs> I know that sounds- I, I don't know, that sounds a lot like bragging, like I could just do anything, but like, you know, whenever I see other creators or, or like other things that I like in my past or in my childhood, I'm like, I want to make something like that, so I learn how to do it, and then I, I, I do it. And one thing that motivates me is, um, I think to myself, well, a human made those, and I'm a human, so I could probably make those as well. Is there a tabletop RPG you've been wanting to play, but can't find a group for? Not really itching to play it, but there's something by the people who made Pathfinder called Starfinder, which is sort of like sci-fi D&D. And I played a little bit of it with some friends a while back, but never really got too far. And I would totally love to try that with uh you know with another group one day i don't know can i do a flip you're the guy on youtube right do a flip yeah what's my favorite type of fantasy creature it, i know this is very vanilla but dragons i think they're very cool and they can be a lot of different flavors if it's not sword and shield what weapon is your favorite in monster hunter uh, okay so if sword and shield didn't exist I guess I would go with Light Bowgun. I really like it. It's mobile like the Sword and Shield, you get a lot of utility, and I don't know, it just looks cool to me. 
The 1st of November is my birthday. Can I get a happy birthday message from you? Happy birthday, Neko Lyra. Yeah, I like seeing your art in my feed. How long have I been playing Pokemon? I got my first copy of Pokemon that I officially owned and not just borrowed from a friend like playing like one day or like a few hours. Uh, in 2008, it was Pokemon Diamond for a DS, and I got them both on the same day. I was very excited. How do I draw hair, and by extension, facial hair? I draw hair very swishy and swirly. Um, I think that's when my hand is loosest and most free, and I think that's when my lines are the most confident, because hair, uh, hair has the lucky part, uh, that makes them- that they don't conform to a specific shape most of the time. So they're- it's pretty easy to draw for me. I have a lot of fun drawing hair. And same thing for facial hair. I kind of let my hand go free and flow. How did I get so cute? I secrete toxic pheromones that can be contracted audibly and visually that causes an emotional reaction in the recipient, tricking them into feeling something similar to adoration. Do I have any animals and or any animals I wish I owned? Uh, no, I don't have any pets and I don't think I really plan on having any pets. I may in the future, things change, but I don't know, I, I'm pretty happy with myself. Uh, I don't feel like I want to take care of another thing right now. And I wouldn't want to get it just for the hell of it. I think that would be very irresponsible of me. I would want to wait until I was financially capable of taking care of an animal and, you know, give it the best that I could possibly give it and not just half-ass raising that pet. I would want to make sure that I can afford all the food that it needs, all the shots that it needs, the sort of environment that it needs, and also live a lifestyle that complements it, which I don't think I have right now. Do I have any tips for aspiring creators who hate everything they create? Uh, yeah, one piece of motivation. If you're hating everything you create, that means you're improving rapidly. That means you are better than what you're capable of, technically, because you're able to see the flaws in your work, and you just have to get at it. You have to keep making, because you're improving faster than you're able to finish whatever it is you're working on. So that means the next thing you're gonna work on is gonna look even better. In fact, here's a little practice. If you say, let's say you're drawing, try drawing one thing and then draw it again. That's the very same thing. Draw it again a second time and just try to make it better. And then a third time and then a fourth time and then a fifth time. Try that little exercise and you know, whatever it is you create. Like if it's knitting, try knitting the same thing a few times, maybe half a dozen before you move on to the next one. See what you learn. If I could add any race and or class to D&D, what would I add? I don't know, there's a lot of races uh, that pretty much cover everything that I could think of. There are way too many flavors of elf out there. Anything I would have made would probably just be a sub-race of something that exists, which you could just easily homebrew. And as for classes, I don't know, I feel like all the classes in 5e are pretty much cover every aspect. They, they pretty much take care of everything, and the subclasses as well, kind of like, take care of every other, like, flavor of that class. And anything that's missing seems to already be coming down the pipeline, like the Artificer. What was is my biggest challenge when making content in the physical process sense and the mental calculating sense? Uh, I guess time. Time and my limitations as a human being, because I need sleep and eat and social time and me time. Because if I didn't need any of those things, I could definitely get a lot more done. Also, I get bored sometimes working on one thing for a long time, and I just want to move on, you know? It can really demotivate me. As for physical, I guess staring at the screen for a long time and how I look at it, especially when I draw, kind of hurts my neck. I really should get a better chair. When making D&D characters, do you catch yourself building the same thing over and over? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, for NPCs, I like to make a lot of archetypes. And for characters, I haven't really run out of them. I'm sure once I run out of archetypes and ideas, I might reuse some of them. What is my greatest weakness? Well, if I told you, you'd be able to exploit it. Favorite and least favorite Pokemon of each type. It would take me way too long to say this out verbally, so here's a list. Yep, there are multiple favorites and least favorites. Fight me. How often do I utilize backgrounds, not even for the equipment, but just to give my characters some extra flavor? I actually like to use backgrounds as a basis for backstory, especially if I can't think of one coming up. I just look at the list of backgrounds and then I pick one and kind of build a backstory around that. Why are they an acolyte? You know, why are they a hermit? What series of events led them to be this sort of background? Things like that. If I had the ability to bring a cancelled game or show back, which one would it be? For game, definitely Scalebound. That thing just looks so cool, like How to Train Your Dragon times 11. And as for show, the original Teen Titans. What do I think is actually the best spell in D&D? 
Prestidigitation. Do I have future projects I want to show one day, i.e. stories, series, new video ideas? Also, do I have any tips to young people planning on creating their own projects? Yes, I do have plenty of plans for bigger things. Long-term plans in the future, that things I want to try one day. And as far as creating your own project, all you need is the drive and the motivation and the willpower, and not the equipment. Don't be fooled. You don't need amazing equipment and tools to make amazing things. They do help, and although sometimes they are required, it will all mostly come down to you and your capabilities and your willpower. If I can make this music video with MS Paint and Windows Movie Maker when I was 15, then that proves that you don't need fancy equipment to do fancy stuff. Tell your sweater look nice. Code monkey offer by you soda. Bring you cup, bring you ice. How's the rest of the hijack crew doing? Pretty good. For those of you who don't know, hijack is my group of friends. Uh, we do have a channel where we upload group stuff. It's just a little slow at the moment. Haven't uploaded in quite a few months because I've been busy focusing on my channel and everyone else isn't really as video savvy as I am. So, um, you know, it's on indefinite hiatus because uh, making videos is hard, believe it or not. And if I'm the only one who knows how to make videos and I'm working on this channel mostly, then it's usually gonna mean that uh, not many uploads are gonna be on that channel. It's more of like a secondary channel, sort of a hobby for for us. What is something I want to tell my audience that there is never the right moment for? I guess I would like to politely let my audience know to stop giving so many tips and suggestions and advice on how to play a game. Like, I know it's all with good intentions and it's all to try and help me, but I just prefer to play it on my own, you know? And if it results in me failing more often than would otherwise if I did follow that advice, then so be it. I would rather fail on my own terms rather than have a choice be made for me or a suggestion made for me that I didn't figure out on my own and then me resulting in playing the game better just because somebody told me how to do it. A puzzle's no fun when the solution is given to you. I'm way too curious to see how this plays out. I believe that is a poor decision. Maybe, but it's mine to make. There's a lot of moments for me to say that, like, I constantly want to tell people, hey, please don't give me tips, please don't give me directions, please don't give me suggestions. I just want to play the game, and if I miss stuff or am I, if I'm doing something wrong, then I prefer that way, because at least it feels like I'm naturally playing the game. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, then just don't stream it. It's like, but I want to talk with the audience. I like interacting with the audience and, you know, playing live and letting people see my reaction, because people like that stuff. I, I like interacting with the audience, and I can't do that if I don't stream. And, you know, people don't have to give tips. It's not like you're gonna die if you don't, you know? That's that's an urge that is a little difficult to not give into, but once you learn to not give into it, it becomes easier and you can just enjoy them playing the game. How would I improve Ranger? I wouldn't because I'm terrible at balancing. I've looked at Revised Ranger and they basically covered everything that I would want. For Beastmaster, essentially, they already fixed it. They're like, it's its own thing that uh, has its own action and bonus action. I'm not the best at balancing and you can ask my players for that because I give really broken items when I DM. Who's my favorite D&D character I've ever played with, not as? So far, I'm running a game with Connor McKinley, aka Senile Snake, aka Distortion Devil, and he is playing a, an illusion wizard, and he is the most hilarious character I've ever seen, and I love the way he talks and the way he acts. Basically, he's kind of a sneak, and he likes to trick people a lot. So here's the setup. The players are fighting one of the main villains early on. Like, this is way, way more early than they're supposed to fight him. And so the paladin runs in, played by Monty Glue, uh, the DM of the Unexpectables. The paladin runs in and just, like, starts wailing on the main villain, nearly killing him. And Connor's character, disguised as one of the cult members and convinced them that he's one of them, he goes... Klaus is going to point in horror at the scene he just witnessed. She's <laughs> like, oh my god, Laszlo is about to be defeated. We should fucking run! <laughs> <laughs> and he's gonna start bolting. <laughs> After making a successful persuasion roll, everyone just loses their minds. All the lower rank cult members are just like terrified and run away. He is an amazing 
role player. Oh, Connor McKinley, everybody. What's one thing that inspires me to continue making great content? I want to keep making bigger and better stuff. I guess that's it. I have a long-term goal to, like, make, you know, like, make my own animated short film or show or movie or video game, you know? Like, and I know that's incredibly ambitious, but, you know, I, I'm slowly working my way towards bigger and better stuff. And I might even, you know, like work towards that on YouTube. Maybe one day I stop making these more traditional videos and like take more time off to make these bigger productions and then make them super duper high quality and, and share them. That's sort of the thing that I, I always keep in my sights is like, this is sort of my training, I guess, my training regime, that these are all proof of concepts and, and ways of me to practice different skills so that I can build up and make something like truly amazing and great and big production value, you know? I guess that. Do you think an art degree is necessary to bring out a successful artist? Absolutely not. I have an art degree. I graduated a Bachelor of Graphic Design, but I still feel as though, like, most of this I could have done on my own because I was doing this stuff even before college, but I guess college gave me an excuse to, like, really explore and, like, learn some things. But I feel like Although maybe not as skilled as I am now and knowledgeable as I am now, I think even without a higher education, I could have done something very similar. That said, I don't think a higher education is completely worthless. I think you still learn a lot of things there that you wouldn't otherwise from like a YouTube video or like a tutorial. Because there are a lot of things that they teach you in class, you know, on how to do like, like improv and on the fly thinking and, you know, critical thinking and critiquing people and all that stuff that you have to do in practice that you don't necessarily get to do unless you're in a class. So although I don't think it's completely necessary, I do think it helps, but also doesn't help everyone because I feel like some people are fully capable without it. Any of the Unearthed Arcana material do I enjoy or hate and why? I don't really delve into Unearthed Arcana. I just kind of ignore it. I don't have any opinions. Have I ever got the chance to check out Dauntless yet? Yes! Uh, unfortunately, I played it when it first came out and it had a lot of connection issues and I didn't really get to sink my teeth into it. But I did play it a little bit before I went to PAX and I got to meet the developers at PAX West and it was really nice to see them. But yeah, I, I talked with them and they seem like very nice people. Do I have any advice for someone in an artistic rut? For the past month or so, when you go to draw, you feel just overwhelmed and eventually you just lose interest. It's okay to take a break and uh, try some other things, you know, do some other things you've been meaning to do. That's what I'm doing essentially right now is just like kind of taking a break from making videos to do other things, you know? so that my creativity can come back, you know, wait for inspiration to come. And I know it's a, it can be dangerous to wait for inspiration to come, but sometimes those things can inspire, you know, like uh, people give the advice of live your life and, you know, they say go out, travel. And although, you know, that's expensive, the basis of that is that doing other things can inspire you with your creativity. Try something new. Go out, go roller skating. I don't know, take on, take a dance class. You might discover some things about yourself and in the process, get some inspiration to do some of your passions again. What's my preferred snack food? Nature Valley granola bars. My favorite are the peanut butter ones. Now that we're done with the Twitter questions, let's go on to the YouTube community questions, which are a lot. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to get to so many of them. So I'll just get the highest upvoted ones. What's my opinion on a apocalyptic RPGs that are either post or during an apocalypse. I think they're really interesting. I, I like me a good old post-apocalypse because they can give opportunity for some really interesting stories and interesting characters. And I like me a good Fallout and uh, Outer Worlds, which looks pretty good. I might try it out. I don't know. I just worry that it's another game on the pile that's like a bajillion hours that is going to take a long time to beat. I really like hopeful apocalyptic settings though, like things with a lot of overgrowth and nice pretty trees and pretty environments, like all the apocalypse, the apocalypse has ended already and everything's just kind of like healing and in the process of repair. Destiny is a good example of that. I really like the setting of Destiny. I think it's pretty cool. Oh man, I see like half of these comments are like, are you going to make a crap guide to X? And it's like, uh, no, sorry. Did I develop my style on purpose or was it a matter of this is just how I draw? A little bit of both. I, you know, like developing an art style is like you start to draw a certain thing that appeals to you. So, you know, that is 
on purpose and that eventually becomes a habit in how you draw and that's how you develop an art style. For example, my art style has slightly evolved in the fact that I simplify noses a little bit more because I just don't like how they look. And now I get ever so closer to drawing in an anime style. <laughs> Did Storg and Isabel get together? So. Those of you who don't know, I once had a half-orc bard character named Storig, and if you would like to learn more about him, uh, Dingo Doodles actually has a little animation video where I tell a little story about Storig, and I'll put a little link to it right here. Yeah, you go watch it. It's really good. And uh, so yeah, he had a love interest, an elf named Isabel, and they were very wholesome together, very sweet. And uh, that campaign unfortunately didn't really go anywhere. It uh, didn't have a proper conclusion and it kind of dropped off after a while. But I like to think after whatever it is mission that they had to do, killing Tiamat or maybe they failed or maybe Tiamat was just banished until the next thousand years. I like to think that he went back with her and op finally opened up his theater. Am I going to answer this question? Was the influx of new viewership slash subs that came with the crap guide to D&D series a stressful period for me. Did I second guess myself question decisions I made for coming videos? Yes and yes, but it wasn't the first time. The first influx that happened was when I made the crap guide to Monster Hunter, and when it was leading up to the Sword and Shield, which was like the pinnacle final episode, basically all the big Monster Hunter names were commenting on my videos. I'm like, oh my god, this is insane. And then I, ha I was in a rut of like, what do I do now? The series is over and I kind of don't want to make a bajillion other ones because I'm kind of satisfied with its conclusion and I don't want to just like keep beating a dead horse, you know, and holding on to th this. So I made, you know, like as some of you may remember, I made this video, this video essay called Klonoa a couple of months later that it was all leading up to and then it just bombed because it was the complete opposite kind of content that people subscribe to me for. And that was really discouraging. And it still kind of sometimes happens now, like, you know, obviously a lot of the videos that I make are not what people came here for, so most of them people don't watch. But I do really appreciate the people who did stick around. And sometimes I do feel a little bit discouraged, but to me, as long as, like, once it reaches, like, a certain threshold of views, I'm like, okay, I'm satisfied. They don't all need to be, like, a million views in their first week, uh, you know, they don't even need to be a hundred thousand in their first week. I'm pretty at peace with myself with them now. I mean, sometimes every now and then I'll still get a little bit stressed or bummed out when a video doesn't perform well, but for me, this is just a creative thing. And yeah, I do make money on the side, but it's definitely not from YouTube. You'd be surprised how little I make from these viral videos, especially the Crap Guide to D&D series. But yeah, I, I make a nice income from the streams and from Patreon, and those of you who do support me there, I very much appreciate it and you allow me to continue to make this and everyone should be grateful for those people. So yeah, audience, thank the patrons and thank all the people who donate to streams, all the subscribers on streams. I, I guess I do question myself and second guess myself if I should only make these short comedy videos and only make that stuff and because that way I'll have a consistent, you know, amount of views, but you know, at my heart, I, that's not really what satisfies me. And at the core of my creativity, I want to make a bunch of stuff. And if some of it isn't appealing to people, then uh, I guess that's just how it is. I just got to deal with it and be satisfied with what I make. Because, um, I mean, a lot of people don't have a huge audience. And uh, for most of my life, I didn't have a bunch of eyes watching everything I did and everything I made. And, you know, I learned how to be satisfied with my art back then. So I guess I got to relearn that now. Because you can't really rely on other people to value your art, because sometimes people aren't. The only reliable person who can appreciate your own art is you. What D&D spells would I most want to have in real life? Oh, that's another tough one that I don't think I can answer just because there are so many useful spells. Especially if I had to pick one, in which case I, I just don't even know. I guess Mage Hand would be pretty useful. I don't really want all the massively powerful spells. Kind of, I just want the more humble ones because I don't think I can be trusted with the more powerful spells. Maybe even Prestidigitation, just so it wouldn't raise suspicion. I could do some, you know, magic things on stage. Thaumaturgy would probably be pretty neat. Is the Wiggler a separate entity from me? Yeah, I like to consider him like a, a, an alter ego. I can I call him Joe Crap because he does the crap guides. Kind of a satirical take on people who take guides a little bit too seriously and anybody who strays away from the guide being like, you know, lesser. So he's like, you should do this and if you don't then you're a stupid condescending, talking down to everyone, and pretending the thing that he likes is, like, the best thing, while everybody else's tastes are garbage. 
it's a really fun character to play. I hope I've done a good job of establishing that because, you know, satire is a very delicate balance. And if you do it wrong, some people can believe that that's how you think and that your jokes aren't real jokes. And if that's the case, then I would have failed at expressing that joke because if most people are confused by it, then uh, I didn't tell a very good joke. Did I ever think about starting my own D&D campaign on YouTube, Twitch as a player or DM? Yes, I have thought about it. I just don't know how I would do it. I worry that if I streamed it, I wouldn't be interacting with the audience, which defeats the purpose of streaming. And also, you know, sometimes connection issues happen and there are too many things to keep track of live while you're streaming that I worry about giving a, a good experience to the viewers as well as the players. And for YouTube, again, I'm one guy and I edit everything, so it would be pretty intense on me and it would depend on how I feel I can do it. And also, because I go overboard, I would want to put so much effort into it and so much editing and like special stuff like I wouldn't be satisfied just cutting it down just like doing cuts of all the dead air and stuff like I would want to add extra stuff I don't know I guess that's one of my weaknesses is I'm too much of a perfectionist that it results in me not releasing videos when they're probably just good enough and I could have just uploaded them and it's not it, I'm not humble bragging either it's actually a problem where like the video is fine and I could just upload it but oh no I gotta add this extra thing I think I would do that with D&D videos which is why I'm not doing them right now is there a favorite personality that I give most of my characters? What advice would I give to someone trying to make each of their characters unique? Well, regarding that second half of the question, you could give them an aspect of yourself because, you know, the saying write what you know is very true. That's what I like to give to my characters, is just think an aspect of myself and sometimes how I feel a certain way and play that. Or, alternatively, you could always rip off character types, just like, think what's one of your favorite characters, try to play them, you know, or or some of your least favorite characters, or some characters you despise or really like or think are funny. It's okay to totally steal things for D&D and just try to make it your own. And it can teach you a lot about yourself and your role play and, you know, a bunch of stuff, how to write characters and how to express them and stuff. And a personality I like to give my characters is uh, aspiration. I like to give them all an aspiration of some kind, a want. Storig wants to own a theater. Rat, my other bard, he wants to perform to earn enough money to buy an airship and travel the world. I have a goblin hexblade warlock named Plek who has a sword and shield and he one day wants to become a knight in literal shining armor. The cleric, Gadiel, that I made for Crap Guide and I also played in Too Many Warlocks, which you can go watch the VOD here. He wants to someday make armor for royalty, like the king or the queen. I like to give them wants, you know, of course, very Disney-like. But yeah, I like to give them a, a long-term goal of some kind that they can work towards. Something that pushes them to do what they do. Do I think I'll make another How Do You Design video? I really like the Pokemon one. I definitely do want to make more video essays with all those assets that I made for both that and the Klonoa video. It's just that those take such a long time to do. And I know a majority of you are waiting on other videos like more crap guides and more Pokemon Nuzlocke. And like, I can only do so many things at once. Most of the time I only work on one video at a time, so I'd like to, but no promises. What is my favorite Monster Hunter class? There are no classes in Monster Hunter, but if you're talking about monsters, I guess Fanged Beasts, because it's very, it strays really far away from the traditional dragons and dinosaurs that Monster Hunter is known for. And, you know, it's got things like Arzuros and Lagombi, which I love. It's got, like, the primates, you know, Rajang, Blaganga, Kongalala, Ketchawacha, and it's got Gamoth, which is a big old mammoth, and I love, I love elephants. If you're talking about monster classification, I guess Fanged Beasts. How is the job hunting going, and is there anything you as a community can do to help me and get me where I want to be going? Well, I mean, the people who are already supporting me, I think you're doing a pretty good job as it is. Uh... I very much appreciate it. If you're wondering, I have a Patreon that is a consistent source of income that I'm currently saving up so that I can one day, you know, get my own place so that I can have a better setup for a working space because currently I still live with my parents. And right now I'm saving up a lot of money and the people who are part of my Patreon are helping me save up for that, as well as the people who donate to me on my streams. I very much appreciate it. You're allowing me to live and continue to do this thing that I love and are keeping the channel together because otherwise I think my family would get pretty tired of me doing this and tell me to go get a real job and I think I would have dropped this a long time ago but when I show the amount of support that I get from you guys um, I, I get support from them as well and I understand you know it's it's warranted they want me to be able to actually live 
off of this stuff. And, you know, judging by the direction that this is going, it very well might might be. And, and that would be pretty cool. I will say, if you feel as though you don't have enough money to send my way to not worry about it, and that watching my videos on their own is already good enough a support, that is more support than I could ever ask for, and that you shouldn't feel bad if you're not able to donate, because... I know pretty well what it's like to not have disposable income. And don't worry, I still make a little bit of money from the ad revenue for the videos. And although maybe you might not be able to join my Patreon or like donate on my Twitch and things, by watching my videos you increase its recommendation in the algorithm and it might be recommended to somebody who does donate to my Patreon or my Twitch. So just by watching my videos, commenting on my videos, liking my videos, you're doing your part and I thank you for that. What's a game series that you've always wanted to get into but never have? Not series, but Final Fantasy XIV specifically. I have uh, over 200 hours in that game and it's still not clicking with me, so I just decided to drop it. And it was like such a ca bad case of like people saying, oh, wait till you get to this, and then I would get to this, and then I would just be like, okay, I finished this and I'm still not feeling it. They're like, oh, wait till you get to X, and I'm gonna get to X, and I'm like, okay, now what? Wait till you get to Y. It really, really gets good at Y, and I'm like, this is like the fifth time this has happened. I'm not feeling it. It's not clicking. I've spent so much money on the subscription and I'm 200 hours in and I'm still not having fun. I tried playing with friends. I finished the main story. I finished Heaven's Word. I did like all the class quests. I tried. I did the raids. I tried. I really, really tried. I just, it just wasn't. I've never ever wanted to like a game more than I have with Final Fantasy XIV, but I tried and it's just not sticking with me. I'm sorry. I wouldn't be able to tell you why it is, but it's just not clicking. And I'm, I'm tired of trying because I've tried everything. I, I Trust me, I have tried everything. I know some of you are still going to suggest in the comments, oh, play with friends, play, do, do this raid, do, do this story. It's like, no. I'm, I'm done. I already, I've done everything. People keep saying that, you know, Heaven's Word was the pinnacle before Shadowbringers came. And now people are like, oh, play Shadowbringers. Once you beat Shadowbringers, then decide if you... It's like, no, I've, I've already, already done. If I'm not liking it after Heaven's Word and after 200 hours, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna change my mind. I'm sorry. Also, I'm done spending money. I've spent too much money on it already. I'm not gonna continue spending money on a game that I'm not enjoying. And if the only times that I am enjoying it is while I'm playing it with friends, is it really the game that I'm enjoying or do I just like hanging out with friends? Because if it's the latter, I think I would just rather do that with a game I actually enjoyed. Out of all the videos I've made since starting YouTube, which am I most and which am I least proud of? So most proud of is obviously the Klonoa video. I've already talked a lot about that, which hey, if you haven't watched, you can watch it. Uh, and if you already have watched it, you can watch it again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'll stop shilling for that video. But least proud of, I think, my stream highlight for Smash Bros and my stream highlight for Final Fantasy XIV. Because that's an example of the effort that I don't want to put in videos. It's, like, very basic, general, like, cuts and stream highlights that doesn't really set it apart from any other stream highlight, aside from the fact that it's just me. Which, you know, some people mostly come for the personality, but I also want there to be something there for people who don't come for me, you know? Like, a reason to watch if they don't know who I am. And I feel like those videos, they, they don't give that reason. Do I think I'll always keep the username Joe Cat? Yeah, I, I, I will. Cats are not my favorite animal. Uh, I don't know what my favorite animal is, but it's a, a shortening of my full name, Joseph Catalanello, and it's a nickname I had in high school, Joe Cat. If I could have a custom tailored game that had mechanics and features that I specifically wanted in a game, and that I thought would have made one of my favorite games even better, what would it be? Like Joe Cat's custom game. There's too many. I don't know. I might make a video one day, and I'm, this is not a promise. It's like maybe one day I'll come up with my ideal video game, like the game that I would always want to make. It would be a, a, an action RPG with a lot of roleplay elements and an in depth ca uh, character customizer with a lot of stats and a lot of customizing. Not just stats, but visually as well. It would have a fun art style, nice and colorful, bright. It would have an overall positive tone, happy, and like. Probably at worst rated T. I don't want it to be like depressing and grungy and mature. It, it would mostly be a fun time and a nice positive experience. It would probably be fantasy. I don't know, there's too much. There's too much to my perfect game that would never happen. 
But I don't know, it's a fun thing to fantasize about. Who do I want to collaborate with next? I guess Davy Chappie. I would love to make a video with him. I don't know what it would be about or what kind of style of video, but I don't know. He seems like a cool guy. I got to talk to him a few times and play Divinity 2 with him. He's pretty cool to hang out with. Favorite Pokemon from each generation? I guess I could answer this one since it's shorter than the other Pokemon question. First gen is probably the Nidoran line. And if I had to pick one, I guess Nidoking the most. I know that's kind of vanilla because he's like the, the definitive Pokemon. That's like the top tier of top tier Pokemon designs. When people think of like Pocket Monster, they think of Nidoking. For second gen, definitely Piloswine. Piloswine is adorable and I love it. And I wish that Mamoswine looked more like Piloswine. I honestly think the design of Mamoswine is a step down. Third gen is probably Shedinja. I just wish it was better. It's not a very good Pokemon, but I like the gimmick and I like the design of the Pokemon. And uh, Ghost is my favorite, one of my favorite types along with Grass. I just really like Ghost types and it's just cool. Fourth gen is the Turtwig line. If I had to pick one, I guess Torterra, but it's, you know, you know, it's, it's very cool and I love it. But there's a lot of contenders because fourth gen, it was my first Pokemon game. So I like a lot of Pokemon from that generation. Fifth gen is definitely either Joltik or Galvantula, uh, that line. I guess if I had to pick one, Galvantula. Wait, no, Joltik because Joltik is adorable. I don't like spiders. I, in fact, I dislike spiders. I'm not a big fan, but I don't know. This thing is just adorable and I love it. And I love the type combination. It's so unique and cool. Most of the time I end up having a lot of slow Pokemon and having this one on the team just being so fast is a nice change of pace for me. It's just very cool to have a Pokemon that basically goes before everything. Sixth gen is Hone Edge. It's a possessed sword. Yeah, not Aegislash, Hone Edge. I actually just like the design of Hone Edge more than Aegislash ever so slightly. Aegislash is very, very cool, and yes, it's a sword and shield, but if I just had to have one with me, like a Rhyme Sona, like from Detective Pikachu, it would definitely be Hone Edge. Just a Hone Edge, buddy. And don't tell me if I grab the handle or sash that it'll suck my soul and I'll die, because the De Pokedex says the same thing about looking into Shedinja's back, and we do that all the time and we're fine. So don't go pulling the Pokedex entry on me, because the Pokedex entry cannot be trusted anyway. It's so inconsistent. And honestly, you could just cherry pick any part of the Pokedex that you want really. And 7th gen is Mimikyu. It is just so adorable and it's a ghost type and a fairy type. Ah, I love it. I love Mimikyu so much. Close runner-up is the Rowlet line. How did I meet Dan Plan? Well, Dan actually reached out to me. He just, because apparently he's been talking with other D&D creators before me and I guess he learned that they contacted me as well and kind of just indoctrinated me in. And Dan was like, hey, you want to join us for a couple of videos? I'm like, uh, all right, yeah, sure. And I guess just became friends from there. And how did I come to meet some of the other D&D YouTubers? Same thing. They just contacted me and were like, hey, what's up? <laughs> what made me decide to start the Crap Guide series? Uh, well, I guess I just wanted something like that to exist. One of the most powerful feelings you can have as a creator is that you can make whatever you want to exist. If it doesn't exist, you can you have the power to make it. There wasn't really a massive community around Monster Hunter before World. There were some people that you would know, you know, like Eryx and Gaijin Hunter, but not a lot of people made things for Monster Hunter, especially. And that, that usually means that there's less funny things if there's a smaller community around it. So I wanted to be one of the people who made some of this funny thing that I would see other people make for other games and movies and shows and stuff. I wanted to make it for Monster Hunter because it was just getting its first big ol' like massive community footsteps. I guess I saw an opportunity to fill a niche that was open and uh, it paid off. Okay, and I think that's all the questions I'll be able to answer now because there are a lot more questions this time than uh, my last Q&A video because there's a lot more of you. Sorry if I wasn't able to get to your question. It was, there was a lot of repeating ones that I hope I was able to answer. But yeah, I very much appreciate you participating in this Q&A and asking me these questions and also very much appreciate you continuing to support me, watch my videos. It really means a lot and it really, really does help motivate me to make this awesome stuff for everyone. But yeah, a few more videos coming soon, but now I guess uh, I'm gonna take my break and I will see you guys in December.